September 21st, 2019, the day began with much excitement. I left for Badrinath at about 4.30 a.m. I decided to travel on a state transport bus. These buses regularly ply between Rishikesh and Badrinath. I was brave enough to take this bus. This is uh, my Savari. It says Joshima to Badrinath. And uh, we have stopped at this little little place for breakfast. So these guys stopped at this really little place. They make hot parathas and chai for breakfast. That's what you're having here. You see these little school kids going to school. How it is constant traffic, and uh, these are the size. This is the kind of size of the bus that you would get to travel 22, 23 seater. It's a rule to honk in India, anyway. So, 22, 23 seaters because the rows are so narrow. One has to uh, go with these small buses. I don't know if larger buses can even make it. I'm in the bus now and I'm going to try and give you a glimpse of what this journey will be like. It's pretty interesting.
typical example, you can see what happens. The traffic on either side is stopped. Stopped on either side and we have to wait for them to clear this. And the only then we can proceed. So that's probably about an hour delay in the drive. This is the Alaknanda flowing. We are very close to Badrinath. Late in the evening, it was a whole day drive from Rishikesh. Couldn't help stop to record this beautiful flow. September 22nd, 2019. Another beautiful day dawned in this amazing town high up in the mountains. Badrinath, a divine town nested in the Himalayan valley, got its name from the Badrinarayan temple housed here for many thousands of years. The Badrinarayan temple is a temple dedicated to the divine yogi Vishnu or Narayana, who is believed to be doing penance since ancient times. In the sanctum sanctorum of the temple lies a stone image of Lord Vishnu in meditation. It is believed that this stone was naturally created, not man-made, Swayam Vyakta as it is called in Sanskrit. The energy that emanated from this temple was incredible. This is a beautiful experience of being in Badrinath. It's, it's like the Vatican for the Christians and the Mecca for the Muslims. This is the place for the Hindus. Four such places, this is one of them. The energy of Vishnu, Narayana, one who teaches us to live enlightened lifestyle. This is the home the workplace, the center of all of that amazing portal of divine energy that opens out in this place. It's, it's inexplicable. Once you go inside those four walls, it's a whole different world altogether. Something to be experienced. Words fail to describe that. <laughs> Kapal is where you make offerings to your ancestors, forefathers, and it is said that this is the final place to do that. And once you make the offering, as it's called the Pindadhan, then you don't need to do anything because your ancestors will be liberated. That's a belief, and that's been the practice for ages here. People come here and offer their homage, their tribute and let the spirits of the ancestors free.
Meditation on the banks of the Alaknanda is priceless. The river current was fierce and as I sat close to the river, I became aware of its immense power. And yet, instead of fear or anxiety, I felt an incredible calmness. In harmony with the sound of the water, my mind kept humming. Om Namo Narayana Om Namo Narayana Om Namo village apparently the last village in India before China begins so so what I'm going to do is I am planning to just walk down because I asked one guy he charged 500 rupees I think that's way too much it's a good trek uh, the weather is beautiful it's it's probably 40, 40 something, 45 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So it's uh, nice when you walk, you don't feel cold. Last night my head was kind of chilly, so I wore a cap to protect my head. But otherwise, it's pretty neat. Um, so I thought I'll enjoy this scenic walk down to the last village in India. <laughs> it sounds exciting. Let's see what. What is in store there? I believe there is the Gufa or the cave where the great epic Mahabharata was written. Uh, written by Ganesha. So the cave, it's called the Vyasa cave, Vyasa Gufa. I want to go and offer prayers to Ganesha there, sit there and invoke that mighty energy that actually documented that epic uh, historical event that we call the Mahabharata. We have Puranas and Itihasas. So, Puranas are mythological in nature. So, I, I hear people saying mythology, mythology, and, and they talk about Mahabharata as mythology. Mahabharata and Ramayana, story of Rama and the story of Krishna, are not recorded as mythologies. They are recorded as historical events. So, that is Itihasa in Sanskrit. So, one has to pay attention to that. These are places where these historical events are supposed to have occurred now you you cannot prove otherwise so why not just stick to what has been passed on for generations down because um, there's no way to prove whether exactly this is where Pandavas walked or this is where Ganesha wrote the Mahabharata there is no way to prove um, prove it wrong so you cannot prove it wrong then you stick to some a story which is not created to attract tourists but this was this these caves have been in 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 vogue has been recorded in history has been passed on from generations and generations so it's worthwhile paying a visit to these places with a sense of reverence and humility rather than agnostic um, attitude that you can deny anything and everything in life right so i choose to be a believer i was a believer this morning at the temple I got so emotional, so that emotion has just come by itself, you know, it just pours when you suddenly feel a ch everybody is charged in the temple. Each one is screaming and chanting, Om Namo Bhagavate, somebody is singing, it's horrible singing, right? From music point of view, it's just, it's cacophony. But then, but then there is an energy there and that, that is what I experienced. So, and the silence sitting after that behind the temple was one of the most powerful meditations I've ever had. So again, I know I repeat this so much. These are powerful portals that connect you to higher dimensions effortlessly. Is, how do you describe that in words? I don't know. So anyway, with all that said, I am headed to Mana. I still have one, one more kilometer, just a little less than one kilometer. But there's something that I was thinking as I was walking alone when we spoke of Rama and Krishna and Narayana and Vish Vishnu and Shiva. There are three primordial energies. 
One is pure creative in nature. That is the energy of Brahma. It's in potential form. You know, we, we all have creativity of some form uh, in us. Some of us can dance, some of us can sing, some of us can write. Now, some of you might say, oh, what? I can't do any of them. But there is something in you that is special. Trust me. Um, even if you're good in studies, that's the, your creative potential. Maybe you're good in math. Maybe you're good in, in your laboratory experiments. Maybe you feel um, one when you go out and serve people or something. There is something creative that takes your mind above the mundane and you begin to become your best. Right? That creative energy is Brahma. That Brahma is so, it, it's in a potential form. And therefore, there are no temples because you can't define creativity in any form. How can you define creativity? And therefore, if there was any symbol attached to that, they gave him four heads, all four directions. Creativity, creativity has no limitations. It's not facing only east or west, all directions. So, a sense of omnipresent or omniscience follows that. The, the second powerful energy is the other side other extreme from you have created potential it's in a potential form and then the other side is uh, post enlightenment if you will so how do you explain this so when you say creative potential it is pre enlightenment right the creativity in you What's the ultimate creativity? Your, divin your divinity is your ultimate creativity. So that is in a potential form. That is Brahma waiting to create this universe and create you, create Purna Madha, Purna Midam, Purna, Purna Mudichchade. So everything he wants to create, right? So that is in potential form. So let me, let's call that as a pre-enlightenment, not ignorance, pre-enlightenment stage. Brahma. Now, the other end of the spectrum, is post enlightenment shiva just enlightened he is in ecstasy he is in bliss this energy is where you are not connected with this world and yet you are connected you are a part of all this and yet you are different how do you understand this think of being uh, think of a producer of a movie right the producer is not in the movie you dig the movie in you go into the scripts you you take character by character you look everywhere for this producer, you don't find him. But then without him, the film wouldn't be made. So he is the one who funds it. He sits at the back. So Shiva is that energy. The ultimate, everything merges into Shiva. Ultimately, that consciousness, when one is immersed in that consciousness, when, when one is immersed in that consciousness, one is just like, that's it, Shivoham. Shivoham Chidananda Rupaha Shivoham Shivoham Mano Buddhi Ahankara Chittani Naham I am not the petty mind, I am not the proud intellect, neither the mighty ego nor the minute thought am I. Touch in hearing, taste in seeing, I am not the sensual feelings, I am not the element of earth, I am not the elusive either. I am truth, consciousness, divine bliss, I am the Shiva, the Shiva am I. That is the energy of Shiva. So Shiva is the other end of the spectrum. It's not about creativity or anything. He's, everything culminates in him. And so, that is the second energy. Now in between these two extremes lies a powerful energy that teaches you this path from this potential creativity to ultimate fulfillment. This energy is the energy of Vishnu, of Narayana. Narayana, whereas Nara, the man, Nara is a Sanskrit word for man. So Nara becomes Narayana. Ayana is a path. So the path of the man to become divine, that is Narayana energy. That is a very powerful energy, the supreme energy in the universe because that teaches you how to live your life. How do you live an enlightened lifestyle? Shiva cannot teach you that. The Shiva energy just sits and meditates. That is why if you see the Puranic stories, now I'm, going, I'm saying Purana because these are all, how can you relate to these energies? There wasn't a time uh, 
uh, that these events were recorded in history. These were perennial stories. In other words, symbolic. In other words, Puranas, right? As opposed to historical things like I explained earlier. Anyway, so Shiva doesn't deal with life. He doesn't know how you're going to pay your bills. He doesn't know how to um, how to help you with your marriage problems or how to um, give you a home. If you go to Shiva, he'll say, Sarvam Shivamayam. I am you, you are me. Where, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? That is pure Advaita. So there he takes you there. So when you meditate on Shiva, when you invoke the Om Namah Shivaya, you are merging into that highest consciousness. But then you would say, but how, how do I pay my bills? How do I, I have family, I have um, people to look after. I love this life. I want to help people. I want to serve people. I see diversity. How do I jump from to being Shiva suddenly? I mean, we all get occasional moments of, of Shiva consciousness, right? We can't sustain that for long. It's perhaps not meant to be. Uh, because if you're there, then you have nothing to do with the world. Then that is Jivan Mukta stage. So you 21 days, you'll be there in your body and you'll disappear. So that is the Jivan Mukta stage. But an enlightened lifestyle, that is where Narayana comes in. The energy of Narayana, again, understand these as powerful energies in the cosmos that the rishis and the yogis were blessed with. They, they, they got, they got this, this, this knowledge. They derived this knowledge. They earned it. They did tapas, austerity, penance for hundreds of years, for generations and generations trying to understand the meaning. And then they found in this cosmos, there were frequencies, places like these, like Badrinath, where you could tap into this. And then along with that energy came knowledge, wisdom. So the Narayana energy is that which teaches you enlightened lifestyle, which is why all the incarnations are from Narayana, Dasha avatars. He, he was a fish earlier, then he became, well, well let's see if I get it correct, uh, from fish to amphibian. So he became a tortoise, then he became the boar, then he became a dwarf, then he became a half man, half um, animal, then he became um, a half man, then he became a dwarf, then he became Ra Krishna, Rama and so on. So explaining evolution. So that consciousness of Shiva becomes Narayana and then teaches you how to be a fish when you need to be a fish, how to be a tortoise that learns to live on land and water, like balancing work and family life, how to be a half man, half animal. When could you show your anger and energy and when you should show calmness. So that's what you learn from Narasimha Avatar. There's nothing wrong with animal tendencies. They, they are, a, they are a, a requirement, they're built into nature. But how do you handle them? And then how you are the Vamana, who is short in stature but tremendous in his wisdom. And then you have Rama, a symbol of righteousness. Now having a mission in life, having a purpose, a sense of righteousness and ethics. Then you have Krishna who begins to live life in his fullest measure. So once you have ethics in your life and, and, your, and your, your life revolves around certain powerful values like truth, peace, non-violence and so on, um, love especially, then what happens is, then you live life like Krishna. Then Krishna avatar comes and says, okay, now I'm going to enjoy life. But that, that comes only after Rama. So there is, a, there is a beautiful significance there. So all of this comes from the Narayana energy. Narayana energy is a very powerful energy. When you invoke this energy, Om Namo Narayana, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. You are invoking the Shiva consciousness and the Brahma consciousness into this and say, now teach me. Teach me how to dig out my creative potential and then teach me how to hold this enlightenment and still pay my bills. Still be working with a team of very difficult people to manage. He will teach you. This energy guides you. That is the power of these mantras. These deities, if you will, they don't have human qualities like you and me. So when we, that's what, that's what religion does. It kills the, the spirit 
of spirituality and reduces it to something where now you're afraid Shiva will get angry or Ganesha is waiting to punish you or or something like that. <laughs> and I say this from experience, these, these energies are only love. There is only love. They want to serve you. They want to guide you. These are just potential mantras waiting. It's like a radio station just waiting there with amazing music. You have to dial into that frequency. Otherwise, how will you ever tune into this? So how do you dial into the frequency of Vishnu? How do you dial into the frequency of Shiva? How do you dial into the frequency of Ganesha and open up the Muladhara and awaken? So these mantras, these symbols of the form of Ganesha or Vishnu or, or Shiva are given to us, they were presented to us by these Rishis. And therefore you learn to invoke these energies. Trust me, if you're confused in life, not able to balance the right and wrong between work life and personal life and all of this, the Vishnu energy comes in handy. He will teach you how to do that. If you're too caught up in the worldly life, you want, you want the spiritual gate to open because you hear people talking about it and yet it doesn't make sense to you, then ask Shiva, he'll open up that spiritual part. And then the Brahma brings in the creative energy. So trust me when I say this, all of this is spiritual because it can only be realized when you practice it. You can become a philosopher otherwise, uh, a religious enthusiast if you will, a scholar, but you cannot be a spiritual aspirant if you don't practice. You can get titles and you can, you can write blogs and you can do all of this, but you have to sit and practice Om Namo Narayana. The energy in those powerful mantras is so much that your portals open up and then you will know, oh my God, this is true. I am feeling guided. I, I feel a sense of peace. See, that is the beauty. That sense of peace that fills you is inexplicable. So that is why you need to visit places like this. Go spend some time in an ashram. I spent 15 years in Swami's ashram, in Sai Baba's ashram. That changed my life completely. I, I know God is real. Nobody can change that. Not God as a person outside, but God as divinity within. And anything that you're searching for is finally within. That's what my Sadhguru Sai Baba taught me. I believe in my heart he's an incarnation. I don't want to put the title God to him because I think that limits him. To my definition of what God is. But I know he's an incarnation. He came with a mission to awaken spirituality in our hearts. He did so in my heart. And it's that enthusiasm, that joy, that I'm sharing these thoughts with you. As I'm doing this um, holy trek, I have 190 kilometers or to trek on foot. So there'll be a lot of inspiration that I get I don't know if I'll publish these, but at, at this moment I feel like talking and, I'm, and I want to just share. I feel guided to share these thoughts. So, having said that, we are almost there in Mana village. See there, there it is. Um, welcome to Mana. And so you have the... This is of course the Indian army. They have to be at the border. So they are here. And there's the village. Let's go. Let's go to Vyasa Gufa and see how. Let's 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 go to Vyasa Gufa and invoke the energy of Ganesha. I need his blessings to begin this trip. Well, I've already begun, but tomorrow I'm heading to Satopant Lake, the Lake of Truth, which is a 50-kilometer trek into the hills. We'll see how that goes, and then I'm doing the Panch Kedar trek, the five Kedar temples of Shiva. Uh, again, great portals where you could invoke this energy, whichever energy you want. And I'm in a mood to invoke Shiva energy and just, just enjoy being lost in that Shivoham concept where nothing really matters. Nothing matters. There is no loss. There is no gain. Whether you're rich now, whether you're poor now, whether you're suffering now, whether you're happy now, honestly, nothing matters. The truth is you're none of these. You are experiencing all of this under a fake identity. 
the true identity is you are the shiva please consider subscribing to our channel on youtube the kyg channel so you stay tuned to fresh yoga and spiritual content from kyg thank you for watching enrich your practice empower your mind enlighten your spirit namaste om clean kai val